So tonight we stand together with the people of the Marshall Islands, a country that was part of the trust territory of the United States after World War II. The Marshall Islanders are easygoing and friendly people. They put their trust in the United States, but we abuse that trust by, by testing nuclear weapons on their territory. We began uh, atmospheric nuclear testing in 1946 when we were the only country in the world that possessed nuclear weapons. And we continued testing in the Marshall Islands until 1958, a period of 12 years. During that period, we tested 67 nuclear and thermonuclear weapons. Um, and those weapons that we tested, those 67 weapons, had the equivalent power of 1.7 Hiroshima bombs each day for the 12 year period that we tested there. So just to be clear, we tested 67 times, but it was the power of those weapons that was equal to 1.7 Hiroshima bombs each day for a period of 12 years. On March 1st, 1954, we tested our, our largest nuclear bomb ever, codenamed Bravo. It had the power of 15 million tons of TNT. In the testing, we irradiated many of the people of the Marshall Islands, causing them death, injury, and untold sorrow. Many had to leave their home islands and live elsewhere. Many have suffered cancers and leukemia, and the illnesses and death have carried over into the children of new generations of Marshall Islanders. These are the tragic effects of a world that maintains, tests, and relies upon nuclear weapons. In this world, our human rights are threatened and abused by nuclear weapons as the Marshall Islanders have experienced firsthand. As a traditional nation, the Marshallese enjoyed a self-sufficient, sustainable way of life before nuclear weapons testing. Now, they struggle to uphold basic human rights, the right to adequate health and life, the right to adequate food and nutrition, the right to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, the right to enjoyment of a safe, clean, and healthy, sustainable environment. In September of this year, the Foundation's representative in Geneva spoke to the United Nations Human Rights Council on behalf of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, but speaking for the Marshall Islanders. He stated, quote, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation aligns itself with the United Nations Special Rapporteur's suggestion that the international community, the United States, and the government of the Marshall Islands must develop long-term strategic measures to address the effects of the nuclear testing program and specific challenges in each atoll. As such, it is imperative that the United States government and the international community implement human rights measures to provide adequate redress to the citizens of the Marshall Islands. In other words, it is part of the responsibility of the United States and other nuclear weapon states to clean up the radioactive trail of dangerous debris and of suffering and human rights abuses that they have left behind in their pursuit of ever more powerful and efficient nuclear arms. The man we honor tonight 
Senator Tony DeBroom, was a child when the United States nuclear testing was taken, taking place in his islands. Born in 1945, he personally witnessed most of the detonations that took place and was nine years old when the most powerful of those explosions, the Bravo test, took place. He went on to become one of the first Marshall Islanders to graduate from college from the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And he focused on helping his people to extricate themselves from the legacy of US nuclear testing in his island country. He has dedicated his life to helping his people and to working to assure that they are fairly compensated for the wrongs done to them by nuclear testing. He has served his people in many ways, as a parliamentarian, former minister of foreign affairs, and foreign, former minister of health and the environment. He currently represents Kwajalein in the parliament of the Marshall Islands and is the minister in assistance to the president of the Marshall Islands. Like others who have suffered and witnessed the suffering caused by nuclear weapons, he has a larger vision that what happened to his people should not happen again to any other people or country. I've known Senator Tony DeBroom for many years. He is an untiring leader of his people, deeply engaged in seeking justice. He is a man with a vision of creating a more decent and peaceful future for all humanity. Senator Tony DeBroom is a dedicated peace leader. And tonight, we're very pleased to stand with Senator DeBroom and the people of the Marshall Islands, all the people of the Marshall Islands, as we honor him with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's 2012 Distinguished Peace Leadership Award. Join me in welcoming him to the stage. I think David does not want to let on that we are very old, old friends, because we might betray our age. But David was my sensei in college. He was my karate instructor. And he made a man out of me, that's what he said. <laughs> many, many, many years ago. I am delighted to be here, I'm honored. It is with profound gratitude <clears throat> and humility that I received this Distinguished Peace Leadership Award of 2012. I wish to thank the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation for the great honor. I am aware that in receiving this award, I am following in the footsteps of some of the most gallant and respected notables of our century. Among them, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the late King Hussein, Jacques Cousteau, Walter Cronkite, and many other distinguished champions of peace. I am truly humbled to be following the lead of such exceptional human beings. With their contributions to world peace and harmony, they have touched and influenced many of us gathered this evening and impacted the lives of many more around the world. My life was deeply traumatized by the nuclear legacy of the United States in the Marshall Islands. My public career has been shaped by the nuclear insult to my country and the Marshallese people. I have endeavored to make my modest contributions to peace by bringing their story to the world through all opportunities available to me. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have been a student of this horrific impact of nuclear weapons testing program for most of my life. 
I served as an interpreter for the American officials who proclaimed the bikini safe for resettlement and commenced a program to repatriate the bikini people who for decades barely survived on a secluded island called Kili. I also accompanied the American High Commissioner just two years later to once again remove the repatriated residents of Bikini because concentrations of strontium and cesium had exceeded safe limits and their exposure had become too high for established U.S. government health standards. I was personally involved in the Anahuatoc Environmental Impact Statement that declared Anahuatoc Atoll in the Western Marshall Islands safe for resettlement. In a television interview on CBS 60 Minutes that year, 1973, I expressed my concern to Morley Safer that the military public relations program associated with this cleanup project was more a dog and pony show than anything else. Today, as we speak, most of Anueta is still unsuitable for human habitation. There is a grave, a former crater from one of the tests in Anahuatoc that has been filled with radioactive material that renders most of the atoll unsafe for human habitation for 12,000 years. Later, during the, during the negotiation to terminate the trust territory, we discovered that certain scientific information regarding Anahuatoc was being withheld from us because, as the U.S. official government memo said, Quote, the Marshallese negotiators might make overreaching demands on the United States if these facts about the extent of damage in the islands were known to them. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Marshall Islands' close encounter with the bomb did not just end after the 12 years that David described earlier. In recent years, Documents released by the United States government have uncovered even more horrific aspects of this burden borne by the Marshallese people in the name of international peace and security, or as they were told by the commander who removed the Bikini people from their atoll, it is in the hands of God and is for the good of mankind. U.S. government documents proved in no uncertain terms that its scientists conducted human radiation experiments on Marshallese citizens and American servicemen assigned to our part of the world. Some of our people were injected or coerced to imbibe fluids laced with radioactive substances. Other experimentation involved the purposeful and premature resettlement of people on islands highly contaminated by the weapons test to study how human beings absorb radionuclides either from their foods or from their poisonous environment. Much of this exp experimentation occurred in populations either exposed to already near lethal amounts of radiation or to control populations who are told they would receive medical care for participating in these studies to help their fellow citizens. At the conclusion of all these studies, <clears throat> the United States still maintained that no positive linkage could be established between the tests and the health status of the Marshallese people. The word they used was, you are too few and therefore statistically insignificant. Just in the past, past few years, a National Cancer Institute study has predicted a substantively higher than expected incidence of cancer soon to be experienced in the Marshall Islands, resulting from
from the 50s atomic test. <clears throat> Throughout the years, American nuclear history in the Marshall Islands has been colored with official denial, self-serving control of information, abrogation of commitment to redress the shameful wrongs done to the people. The scientists and the military officials in involved in the testing program picked and chose their study subjects, recognized certain communities as exposed when it served their interests, and denied monitoring and medicinal attention to subgroups within the islands, even though they had been substantially exposed. I remember well their visits to my village in Lique, where they subjected every one of us to tests and other invasive physical examinations. In 1978, as a representative of the Marshall Islands, we raised the issue requesting that the data collected from these, from these examinations be provided to us so that we could make intelligence, intelligent decisions as to how to move forward. The United States representatives responded by saying that our recollections were juvenile and could not possibly reflect the realities of the time. <clears throat> While a resolution to the status question was eventually reached, the issue of damages and personal injury from the testing remains a matter of contention between our two countries to this day. The unresolved aspect of the agreement remains the question of damages and personal injury claims yet to be addressed. Attempts to resolve these outstanding issues through the current treaty between our countries, the Compact of Free Association, have not been successful. The courts have invoked the state statutes of limitations while the administration contends that the circumstances of the claims do not constitute provable differences, change circumstances, they say, from knowledge based on which the agreements in 1986 were entered into. We do not deny signing an agreement. We do admit, though, that this was based on information tailored and provided to us to minimize the extent of the damage. And it is only now that we're finding out that it was much worse than had been presented to us. In order to break this impasse, we would require evidence which has been declared top secret by the United States government to which the public has no access. It is interesting to note that the United States has expressed strong interest to bring the nuclear issues in the Marshall Islands to closure. As recently as three months ago, Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell visited us and told us that this was the policy of the Obama administration. But we have responded that there can be no closure without full disclosure. Further, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the United States government tells us our government, our Marshallese government, is now responsible for nuclear claims stemming from what is called the espousal provision of the Compact of Free Association. That basically says that any claims that may arise against the United States stemming from the testing program will now be the responsibility and the Marshallese government will be reliable for those damages. Ironically, the only other time in history of the United States where espousal was used to squelch claims was in the settlement to release the hostages from Iran. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Last month in Geneva, and David also referred to this, the session of the United Nations Human Rights Council 
adopted the Independent Special Rapporteur's Report, which in short found that the U.S. nuclear testing program in the Marshall Islands resulted in both immediate and continuing effects on the human rights of the Marshallese people. The adopted report also sets forth a set of far-reaching recommendations. Among them, guarantee the right to effective remedy for the Marshallese people, including providing full funding for the Nuclear Claims Tribunal to award adequate compensation for past and future claims, and exploring other forms of reparation where appropriate, such as restitution, rehabilitation, measures of satisfaction, including public apologies, public memorials, and guarantees of non-repetition. Guarantees of non-repetition. The establishment of a truth and reconciliation mechanism may also be justified. How far the United States government will act on these recommendations remain uncertain. However, I must say with full emphasis here that in spite of all that has occurred in this relationship, the American people will not find better friends in the Pacific than the people of the Marshall Islands. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I accept this high honor you bestow upon me this evening in the name of my country my fellow citizens, and all who have in one way or another contributed to the understanding of the Marshallese nuclear plight. I accept it on behalf of Lijan Egnilang and Almira Mariyoshi of Rongalabato, who passed away recently but were never discouraged in their fight to find peace and justice. I dedicate it to the mothers of Rongalab, whose shameful treatment by American scientists, violated all acceptable norms of human decency and respect. I accept it on behalf of Senator Jideng Anjain, who exposed the dark secrets of the experimentation on the Rona people. This honor I also share with Mayor Anjain's son, Lugaj Anjain, who became the first recognized leukemia victim of the nuclear test. I accept this honor on behalf of the Marshallese traditional leaders, especially Irojalabla Chaburokabua and Anju Aloya, who made lands under their stewardship available for the humane settlement of displaced nuclear nomads. I accept it on behalf of the Marshallese community leaders who petitioned in vain to stop the test in 1952 and 1954, and again in 1956. Through the avenues known to them, both directly to the United States and to the United Nations, all without success. I accept on behalf of Senator Ismail John of Anuetak Atoll, who fought to his death to bring justice to the people of his home who to this day remain unable to settle their ancestral land and whose atoll continues to store nuclear waste such as plutonium. I would be remiss if I did not include the many friends throughout the world who have contributed to our knowledge of the dangers of nuclear weapons and the clear and present danger they are to the universe as we know it. I accept it on behalf of all Marshallese whose lives have been directly or indirectly affected by the horrific effects of nuclear tests. <clears throat> but most of all, and my good friend David knows this, I accept on behalf of my granddaughter Zoe, <clears throat> who as a brave young four-year-old battled with leukemia for two years, very difficult years, and is now <clears throat> declared healthy enough to resume school. 
She's happy back in the islands. And I thank God for this wonderful blessing. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> for the use of our country in the maintenance of what is called an unquestionable military supremacy over the world, Kwajalein Atoll, which is my parliamentary constituency and which is the target of the shots that you hear shooting from Vandenberg, has been tasked to bear the burden of the current missile testing under the Ballistic Systems Missile Defense Command. I therefore dedicate this honor also to the people of Kwajalein, whose continued sacrifice of providing the home of their forefathers for the, quote, preservation of international peace and security end quote, continues to this day and for the next 74 years. The Marshall Islands are, no, are by no means the only ones who have experienced a taste of nuclear horror. We associate ourselves with the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Kazakhstan, Chernobyl, Fukushima, the French Polynesians who have had firsthand experience. As David stated to you earlier, the 67 nuclear events in the Marshalls had an equivalent yield of 1.7 Hiroshima shots every day, 365 days a year for 12 years. Every day, 365 days a year for 12 years. This came complete with physical displacement, nuclear illness, birth anomalies, alienation of land, massive destruction of property, injury and death, and the permanent displacement of society. But perhaps the most hurtful of all within that umbrella of destruction is the fact that official denial and secretive cover-up and refusal to accept responsibility was the rule rather than the exception. The Marshall Islands were also subject to years of expensive cleanup and re rehabilitation of land and, and of habitat. Millions were spent by the US military to demonstrate that contamination from nuclear bombs could in fact be cleaned up. That has not succeeded. Hundreds of millions of dollars and many years of military man hours spent in the marshals have failed to clean up what is left, not from a war, but from testing the weapons of war. Most of these islands, as I've stated before, that are declared unfit for human habitation will be so declared for at least 12,000 years. Perhaps the most important lesson to be learned is that any way you look at it, nuclear weapons and the horrific destruction that they bring, whether in war or in experimentation, leave permanent and irreversible damage to man and nature. All things surrounding nuclear weaponry threaten life on our planet and perhaps even in our universe. It is not good for men and women, it's not good for boys and girls. It is not good for dogs and cats. It's harmful to trees, to the plants we eat. It poisons fish and wildlife. It makes our world less, not more secure. If the lessons of the end of World War II and the lessons of all the tests conducted since then have not been learned, then we must learn them. If the experiences of laboratory exposure also denied are not part of our learning pathway, then they must be added. If we do not take the message of nuclear survivors to heart, then we will have to soften our hearts. Nuclear weapons threaten us. They do not protect us. 
No matter where they are located or deployed, one push of a red button could be the end of life as we know it. This is not a chance worth taking. If we continue to imagine any kind of a benefit being derived from the fact that the atomic powers are now armed to the teeth, then the sacrifice of all that we have cited in my brief message tonight would have been in vain. Enlightened modern thinkers of the world have not been blind to this fact. It is just that they have yet to put the matter of the nuclear race to rest. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, barely 48 hours ago, my colleague Bruce Kitchener, who has been very kind to assist me on this trip, were in India at the 11th Conference of the Parties on the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, where 193 countries, both governments and non-government entities, met to discuss the accelerated decline in the integrity of the environment and its genetic resources. Also debated were programs and efforts to address the unsustainable global development direction and the dangers that it poses to the world. As in nuclear disarmament efforts, we have a situation where world leaders fully understand the problem, are aware of the solutions, but cannot decide who should go first. There is no question that if civilization does not keep global warming under two degrees centigrade by 2050, this effort to protect Mother Earth, either through nuclear peace or through environmental sanity, will be in vain. I am confident that the entire membership of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, which I am honored to be part of today, is familiar with the issue and knows what must be done to avoid climate chaos. But like nuclear disarmament, the world knows the problem, it knows the solution, but lacks the political will to execute. As a small island developing state, the Marshall Islands and its neighbors are among the most ecologically vulnerable areas on the planet. We are the victims, again, of world action, but in a different arena. Nevertheless, we are actively working with other Pacific Islands to ensure that ocean resources in the region are governed and protected from exploitation. As a nation whose single most important productive sector and key export is in fisheries, the state of the world's oceans and fish stocks, and how these vital resources are being exploited remain on the list of our immediate priorities. Recently, the Marshall Islands, in partnership with Palau and Micronesia, and with some very, very good advice from our friends in Hawaii and Japan, have undertaken a feasibility study for the introduction of ocean thermal energy into our islands. This technology which, which uses the difference in deep ocean water temperatures to generate electricity, create water and other market, marketable byproducts is very exciting indeed. If successful, OTEC will turn the Marshall Islands and its neighbors from oil dependent basket cases to net exporters of renewable, sustainable clean energy. I should say that on this score, we salute our enlightened leaders and what we see as enlightened efforts on sustainable energy amongst our friends here in California. And we know that many of you have been in this area very proactive. The Marshall Islands cannot afford to wait for global movement on climate change or on nuclear peace. We are barely two meters above the sea level, and <clears throat> if you're only six feet above sea level, the stakes are pretty high here. And having had our share of displaced populations from the nuclear testing program, we do not see moving our people elsewhere 
as a viable option. We are partnering with our neighbors in Micronesia in examining alternative financial mechanisms for economic security and have, had, have held a debt for adaptation swap uh, on climate change workshop in the Marshalls recently. These promises to promise to be innovative means of dealing with non-performing government development loans of the recent past, which keep our islands from developing effectively. The Micronesia Challenge is a partnership of island states of the North Pacific to jointly set aside for protection and for conservation areas of their individual and co collective territories. In addition, Palau, the state of Korsai in Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands have declared a total ban on the harvesting and finning of sharks in their economic zone, effectively creating the world's largest shark sanctuary. We are taking these steps as proud stewards and protectors of some of the world's richest and most diverse ecosystems. We want to leave our planet intact for the benefit of our children and their children's children. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has been stalwart in its mission of nuclear disarmament and the elimination of nuclear threat to man. For the nearly two decades I have been associated with its efforts, I can attest to its diligence and dedication to marshal its resources to the promotion of peace and harmony in a nuclear-free world. That goal is pure in its intent, it's necessary in pursuit, and is the only option, the only option through which we can leave a world where healthy children and a healthy environment can live in harmony now and forever. For whatever is remaining of my life, I pledge to follow this dream, that one day we can rid the world of the scourge of nuclear weapons that peace can be achieved not by what harm we can do to each other, but by what good we can do together. I share in this award, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and recognize with gratitude those who have walked with me in this journey. I want to thank most especially my wife and my best friend, Rosalie, and our three daughters, Doreen, Dolores, and Sally Ann, for always standing by my side and supporting me, even when odds were overwhelming. My dad, my brothers, my sisters, and the numerous people in the islands who've made it possible for me to be recognized and honored, I wish to express to you my deepest gratitude and kamala, and mahalos to my friends in Hawaii as well. For me, the work to address the plight of all affected people continues with renewed determination. We owe it to the nuclear victims and the nuclear survivors. But most importantly, we owe it to the future generations of this planet. 